the decade that was, what's to come, and central banks with a dwindling toolbox. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. We'll sit down with Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. You share your most intimate secrets with your fellow central banker. Harvard University President and National Economic Council Director. I think there's no question that we've done constructive things since uh, 2008. And Roger Ferguson, TIAA CEO. Retirement uh, is at least a challenge, if not a crisis. And former Federal Reserve Vice Chairman. What is the right direction for interest rates? And our special guest, Michelle Flournoy, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. It was the bull market that defied a euro crisis, political earthquakes, and shaky corporate earnings. And central banks danced to a dovish beat. Now we enter the next decade with interest rates at record lows and an asset bubble that some people fear is ready to pop. Let's bring in our roundtable now of Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. So welcome both of you. Larry, give us a sense of this decade that's just happened. A big run-up in the markets, particularly equity. What drove that? Part of what drove it was how weak the markets were at the beginning of the decade as a consequence of the financial crisis. Part of what drove it was we had the longest recovery we have ever had. But crucially, what drove it was that interest rates fell so low that uh, people applied a much lower discount factor to future earnings, and that inflated the price of uh, all assets, whether it was stocks, whether it was real estate, anything that promised future cash flows became more valuable as uh, interest rates came down. So, Roger, that raises the question, obviously, of are we inflating asset values through lower interest rates? So, look, I agree with Larry that, without a doubt, the big driver was the move in interest rates, uh, both here and around the world. The question of are we inflating values, I think it's too strong to say that. That implies some massive bubble that's about to burst. However, what we have seen, David, is that the P.E. multiples have started to increase as well, which is suggesting that every dollar of earnings is getting a bigger and bigger return. So I'd be a little cautious on the word inflating, but I agree completely with Larry that you know, low interest rates were the major driver for markets. Is the market overbought when it comes to equities? I don't think it's clear that it is. I think that given what's happened to interest rates, which in my view is heavily driven by real events in the economy, more saving because more of the money's going to affluent people, less investment because the price of capital goods has come down so far. I think those are the reasons why you have lower interest rates. And when you have lower interest rates, you have higher, uh, higher multiples. I'm not sure that it represents some fundamental imbalance. This certainly isn't a moment like the moment at the beginning of the decade when markets look uh, cheap. And I think we've got to recognize that because interest rates are much lower and maybe risk premiums are the same as they always are, that returns going forward are going to be substantially lower than they have been over the last decade. And that is the question. If low interest rates and starting from a low base drove the last decade, what's going to drive the next decade? I think it's going to depend on the news, and we don't know whether the surprises are going to be positive or negative. But I think if things work out as everybody expects them to, then you're going to be looking at uh, equity returns that are much lower than people have become accustomed to over much, much of the last uh, generation. Uh, my guess uh, would be that uh, if you invest your money in part in stocks and in part in bonds, you're going to be looking at returns perhaps in the 5 6 percent range. Um, which is much lower than people experienced over the last decade. And that's probably going to be an unpleasant surprise for some people. So, Roger, you're responsible for a lot of money, yeah. for a lot of pensions. People are going to count on that money over the long term. What is that thesis that Larry set out? What does that tell you about investing? Well, first, uh, a point I would have made that I didn't hear Larry make, the thing that's going to drive markets over the next several years is what's driven them in the last several. First question is, uh, are interest rates going to remain low, right? And so the expectation that the Fed and other central banks will be on hold for a period of time, I think, is going to continue to support equity valuations and other valuations. Uh, I think Larry is absolutely right. The return that uh, the average investor can expect in equity markets over the next two, three, five, maybe 10 years is going to be somewhat lower than we had in the past. 
Um, that does not mean that it's going to sort of burst. It does mean that one should expect slightly lower returns. The answer to all that, though, when I think about pensions, is you want to have broad diversification. Uh, so equity, fixed income, but certainly alternatives will be another place to look. And then you're going to want to play the big global themes delta. as well. Larry, what do you think? I mean, one of the things that strikes me in the last 10 years is there's a delta. They've been cutting interest rates. Is just static low interest rates enough? That's the key point. Uh, Roger's right about diversification. Roger says they're going to be slightly lower over the next decade. I think it's a good, going to be a good deal more than uh, slightly lower. I think that people will do fine if they earn 5 or 6 percent on uh, their money. I think that people are going to realize that it's not going to be the kind of happy decade that we saw. I think the happy decade came in part from the positive surprise of falling interest rates. That drove up bond prices definitionally, and it drove up stock prices because falling interest rates meant higher multiples. We might see continued low interest rates, but there isn't that much room for interest rates uh, to fall starting from a 10-year of 1.8. So I don't think it's going to be nearly as bullish a period over the next decade as it has been uh, in the last. And since the level of interest rates is a kind of fundamental determinant of everything, um, I don't think that I, I think diversification is absolutely the right strategy. But I don't think people are going to be able to avoid the reality that returns are going to be lower in the future than they have been in the past. Yeah. So I don't fundamentally disagree with Larry's point. And, you know, is it going to be a 4, 5, 6 percent return? Certainly not going to be the 15, 20 percent or almost 30 percent that we saw in 2019. So I think we can agree with that. The other couple of questions we have to come to grips with as we think about this is what's going to happen with corporate earnings? Right? And that was another driver. Uh, and to be fair, they still look healthy, but not outrageously so. But we're going to have to have a review about that for the next several decades. And the other thing, David, I think we have to think about is let's start talking about markets overall and start to think about different parts of the market. Right? So there are going to be some themes that are going to look very exciting. Um, as we Such think. as? Well, think about what's happened at the beginning of this year. You know, mm -hmm. The FANG stocks have continued to take off. Some of them have hit record highs. You know, are, are there more opportunities in technology that have yet been uh, yet to be unlocked? And so I think it's going to be important for the investor to start stop thinking about the market overall for reasons that I think Larry makes you know, really good points, and let's start thinking about what are the big trends and what's likely to be the winner going forward. And that's one of the reasons that many people think that the next decade might be a period when active management and stock picking comes to the fore <laughs> as opposed to well, The last what's decade happened. certainly wasn't that, Larry. Certainly was not. It was all, all passive. Rogers, was all passive. Uh, Rogers much more optimistic about active stock picking. Uh, <laughs> there may be some hedge funds who make some money in active stock picking. There'll always be a few managers who outperform. But I think your listeners would be making a serious mistake if they were to think that they were going to consistently outguess the market. And I think I'm probably a little less optimistic than Roger is about corporate earnings, whether it's bipartisan agreement on the need to regulate pharmaceutical uh, prices or increasing enthusiasm coming from both political parties for increased regulation of technology or a growing sense of the need for more environmental uh, regulation um, or a sense that, if anything, we've gone too far on corporate tax uh, cutting and that might get reversed. All of those things say to me that the public policy environment, mm -hmm. which in many, many ways, particularly since President Trump uh, came into office, has been a big tailwind for corporate earnings. I think corporate earnings are going to hit a variety of headwinds whatever happens to the overall economy going uh, forward. So I'm less optimist. I'm less optimistic. And, yeah, there will be — obviously, there'll be some areas of the market that will outperform. But whether we're going to be able to pick those uh, in advance, uh, I'm not nearly as optimistic about that. We will be back with Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. After a decade of growth, it's clear global central bankers fear a reckoning to come. But are monetary policymakers out of ammunition? 
We're going to discuss with our roundtable. That's next. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Central banks may no longer be the only game in town. That was the sobering message from the American Economic Association's annual conference out in San Diego. A decade after the financial crisis rocked the global economy, policymakers confront a risky world of what could be perpetually low growth, something Larry Summers warned about all the way back in 2013 in a speech to the IMF. And this week, former Fed Chair Janet Yellen agreed with Larry. I agree with Larry's secular stagnation thesis that well before the financial crisis, structural factors had been boosting desired saving and depressing desired investment in most developed countries, causing real rates of interest to trend down. We're back now with Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. So, Larry, I guess congratulations, you were right, but I'm not sure you wanted to be right because it's not good news. Secular stagnation isn't uh, good news. It suggests much more profound trade-offs between rapid economic growth and financial stability and fiscal prudence than we thought we had and raises all kinds of questions for macroeconomic policy uh, going forward. But look, what's happened relative to the time when I put forth that secular stagnation hypothesis in 2013 is we've had bigger deficits than people thought. We've had lower interest rates than people expected. We've had more credit growth and higher asset prices than people expected. So the accelerator's been on the floor, but the car hasn't gone very fast. We've had lower growth and lower inflation than people expected. And what that suggests is that the underlying energy that the private sector generates is much less than uh, it used to be, that we've been able to give some energy, but only by having rising debt-to-GDP ratios, only by having quite extraordinary monetary policies and low interest rates. And there's a question how long that lasts, and there's also a question of what the long-run side effects of that are. You know, people say that the so-called to the re neutral interest rate mm -hmm. has declined by two or three percentage points. What I've been able to show in some recent research um, is that if we hadn't been running up the national debt globally, that probably that real nat neutral interest rate would have declined by four or five mm. uh, or six or seven even uh, percentage points. So there's a fundamental structural challenge around the fact that people are living longer, more of the money is going to people who have high savings rates. And at the same time, as you see with uh, my cell phone that costs $500 and has 100 times as much computing power as the whole Apollo project, capital goods are getting cheaper and cheaper. And so the money sloshes into existing assets, leading to asset price inflation, but with limited economic energy. It's a little bit like the plight of uh, Japan or some, or you might even call it a monetary black hole. So, Roger, as an investor, how do you process all that? Uh, basically, I think Larry's saying we've kept it growing, but mm -hmm. basically running up the credit card. No, look, I think Larry's points are certainly well taken in terms of what happened in the last decade. Uh, the way you process it is to say two things. One is, is there going to be a fundamental change anytime soon? Mm -hmm. Uh, in particular, you know, what we haven't talked very much about is one of the things that's kept rates so low is inflation. And so inflation, for a variety of reasons, has been a no-show, which has allowed central banks to continue to be, you know, very, very accommodative and to drive down interest rates. So the way you play it is, first, is that picture going to change? Are interest rates going to start picking up anytime soon they have to worry about? Secondly, as I said before, you know, what are the asset classes that are going to benefit or not benefit? And so you're going to have to be thinking, you know, much more cleverly about, you know, how you differentiate. You also are looking for, is this a, this has been a global phenomenon. Is the U.S. still the best place to be? Or should we be looking at different emerging markets? How should we think about it? So, again, I think this is a time where you move from the broad general, 
down to a much more narrow, much more focused, much more particular theory. Roger, it strikes me that you are an investor, but you also were vice chair of the Fed. Right. Uh, have the central banks basically done what they could do? Uh, essentially. Yeah. I mean, they've really kept a lot of stimulus, monetary right. stimulus. And have they basically done everything they can do? So, look, I think the general consensus, and I share it, is that the last recovery depended much too heavily on central banks. Um, uh, even here in the U.S., where we had some fiscal stimulus, in hindsight, a lot of folks think maybe we should have done more and kept it going. Certainly, if one looks in Europe, um, clearly, the, you know, we'd say central banks were asked to do too much. So, yeah, I think too much weight has been put on the shoulders of central banks. They responded by doing a couple of things. One is using their regular tools, i.e. called interest rates, and then, two, using uh, some unusual tools, some new tools, quantitative easing, for sure, building up the size of their balance sheets, going in and buying uh, a variety of, of fixed-income securities. And then they, you know, polished up the use of forward guidance, you know, what was it they said. So when you look at the debate that's going on, the question is, uh, is that enough and will that be sufficient the next time around? And I think that's really a question that we former and current central bankers are worried about. Larry, this is something that was uh, the topic of discussion at the AEA, that conference that you attended in San Diego. One of the things that you raised, I believe, others have raised as well, is something called semi-automatic stabilizers. Basically, as I understand it, automatic fiscal injection uh, when certain things turn south. Is that a realistic alternative? It better be. <laughs> um, ben Bernanke gave a speech out there, which I think was a kind of last hurrah for the central bankers. He argued that monetary policy will be able to do it the next time. I think that's pretty unlikely, given that in recessions we usually cut interest rates by five percentage points, and interest rates today are below uh, two percent. And I just don't believe that quantitative easing and that stuff is worth anything like another uh, three percentage points. So I think we're going to have to rely on putting money in people's pockets, on direct uh, government spending. I think that's okay in a country where public investment and infrastructure are decaying uh, so, ba uh, so badly. But I think that's where we're going to have to look for our countercyclical energy. And what Olivier Blanchard and I were talking about when we discussed uh, semi automatic stabilizers was the idea that rely, rather than relying on Congress um, to organize itself to act each time there's an economic downturn, we should do more with rules that would lock in changes in spending, perhaps greater assistance to states, perhaps more assistance for people who are unemployed, perhaps working off a backlog of infrastructure mm -hmm. investments, perhaps giving temporary tax credits for those uh, who spend, and that that kind mm -hmm. of fiscal stimulus is going to have to be a larger part of the story. And I think it's very—I think central bankers have a very difficult road to walk. Because on the one hand, they don't want to say they're out of gas and they can't solve the problem. Right. On the other hand, they'd better be giving some warning if they want fiscal policy to be ready next time. And I think that's reality that it's going to need to be. But, Roger, is it the fact and amount of fiscal stimulus or is it what it's put toward? Because uh, President Trump had a huge fiscal stimulus, right. $1.5 trillion, something like that, in tax cuts. And that doesn't seem to fix the problem. No, I agree. So I. Uh, First, to start with your first question, Larry, are, are semi-automatic stabilizers realistic? My theory, and I think Larry wouldn't disagree, is they're probably not realistic. I mean, it's going to be very hard to get any legislature to get our Congress to say, we're now going to take our hands off the fiscal tools and let it work in some automatic fashion. That's, that's not the way mm -hmm. politics work. Secondly, um, I agree with you that um, how the fiscal stimulus is used is really important. Case example is Japan. Um, huge amount of fiscal stimulus, yet they still have been, you know, well into their second decade of very, very slow growth and borderline disinflation or deflation. Um, third point I'd make is we have to be careful about making this an either or. This is going to be a both and. Whenever there's another recession, monetary policy is going to have to continue to be aggressive. I hope stopping before negative rates, which we saw in Europe. And we will have to have learned the lesson from the last time around, which is fiscal policy is going to have to come in more quickly, more aggressively. And Larry knows very well. Mm -hmm. The last time we confronted this in the U.S., I think we were a little bit more hamstrung in fiscal policy than we wanted to be. Uh, 
Uh, and so we're going to have to have a better sense of, without being overly dramatic, we're going to have to let it rip, so to speak, on fiscal policy because, indeed, monetary policy will do what it can. Mm -hmm. But Larry's right, there's a limit to how much further it can go. So I think we ought to be careful with the debate. We'll be back with Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Each week, we ask our special contributors to bring with them something that particularly caught their eye this week in the world of finance, business, and the economy. We'll start with you, Roger. What caught your eye? So what caught my eye is a law that the president signed uh, a couple of weeks ago, frankly. It's called the SECURE Act. What this does is actually it's the first time we've uh, adjusted private retirement in this country in about a decade. It's going to drive, I think, more people to save. It's going to create a real incentive around having annuitization, which is to create lifetime income for individuals. Uh, it's going to allow small and medium-sized businesses to band together to create uh, private savings for retirement. Uh, and it's going to tell people uh, for the first time what their nest egg is going to uh, result in in terms of lifetime income. So I think this has the potential to be a game changer in terms of getting people to think about retirement, bringing more savings to retirement, and slowing down some of the uh, departures from retirement. Yes, so I think it's going to be in the positive. direction of addressing that retirement gap that you've talked about. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a you big problem in the country. Larry, we'll cut your eye. The Twitter sphere and America are actually very different places. <laughs> and uh, some of the more radical proposals that generated initial enthusiasm involving massive tax increases and massive transformation of our health care system that looked initially like they were very popular, they're looking less popular and their advocates are generating less enthusiasm than seemed to be the case uh, a month ago. And I think that's an important and positive trend. Yeah, I thought that actually in the debate on Detroit, uh, when I watched Elizabeth Warren, tell those UAW members, you're not going to have your insurance plan anymore. And if you know anything about collective bargaining, they've fought long and hard for those deals. Exactly right. It was an echo of something that happened actually almost 60 years ago, 50 years ago, when George McGovern suggested at a UAW convention that he was going to, in favor of extremely high taxes on big estates, they actually booed him out of the place. Wow. And I think that impulse to take, uh, to take from those at the top is not actually as much of a shared universal American impulse, as many suggest. Yes, we've got to work on inequality, but there are much better ways of doing it than just by confiscation. And, and Roger, at a time when there's some skepticism across the country about our federal government to say we're going to take all of our health system and turn it over to the federal government is a, is a tough putt. It's absolutely a tough putt. Look, I think there's a lack of trust in general in big institutions, and frankly, the government is no different. Um, and we also have an unusual time when the governing elite are in some ways attacking the government themselves. Uh, mm. a, a variety of phrases out there that are suggesting that even those in charge of the government don't fully trust it. And so I think people are recognizing, you know, focus on their own self-sufficiency, maybe a focus on community, uh, less, less trust in big institutions, far away institutions, et cetera. So, the world has changed quite a bit, uh, and some of the old standbys, I think, are not being accepted by the electorate the way they used to be. Yeah, okay. It's going to be a fascinating election year, I think it's fair to say. Okay, we're going to be back with Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. It was a week of high geopolitical drama as the United States squared off with Iran. We talk with our special guest, Michelle Flournoy, former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back. From New York, this is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's been a roller coaster start to 2020 for global markets as investors grapple with America's killing of Iranian military leader Soleimani and its aftermath. So over and above all things like prospects for economic growth, changes in monetary policy and government spending, investors have to be considering geopolitics that can change in an instant. 
Michelle Flournoy has made a career of analyzing and understanding forces like these geopolitics and developing strategies to anticipate and respond. She served as the Undersecretary for Policy under Defense Secretaries Robert Gates and Leon Panetta. Michelle joins us now from Washington. Welcome, Michelle. Good to have you with us. Give us your take today. It's a constantly changing story, but it really was a lot of upheaval over the last week. It seems to have calmed down. Is that a false dawn? Well, I do think the circuit breaker has been thrown on the most recent cycle of escalation between uh, Iran and the United States. But I, I think we would be foolish to think that this is over. The fundamental issues that the United States and Iran are in conflict over have not gone away. So I think what we're likely to see is a reversion to sort of previous approaches. You, we've heard that the Trump administration is going to go ahead and increase sanctions, sort of doubling down on their maximum pressure campaign. And for Iran's part, I think you can expect them to revert to their traditional playbook, which is really using more covert and clandestine means that give them some measure of deniability, whether it's cyber attacks or whether it's use of proxies to launch attacks on their behalf. Those are the kinds of things we're going to see in the future, unless we see some kind of breakthrough uh, that gets the parties ba in, back into negotiations. And I don't see any sign of that uh, as yet. So, Michelle, thanks for that setup. A curious question or question on my part is um, markets are very focused on headline risk. Right now, I think there's a general sigh of relief. If, in fact, the Iranians go back to uh, more covert activities, it may be that, that nothing will be visible and markets will therefore be pretty calm. So what's the possibility that the Iranians will do something over the next few p weeks, months, that will really royal markets because it will be surprising, it will be large, it will be visible, and it will be clearly a, a, a direct challenge to, to the United States position? I think that's possible because, you know, where the red line has now been drawn is the killing of Americans. Um, so I think Iran understands that. <laughs> but, you know, I don't think it's out of the question that we could see another attack on either uh, oil tankers in the Gulf or oil infrastructure uh, in the region that would rattle uh, the markets. Because I think Iran understands that our partners in the region um, are vulnerable. Uh, you know, they could, t they could certainly take advantage of that and launch attacks against that infrastructure again if they felt they weren't getting the right attention from the Europeans, from the U.S., they weren't getting support to try to lessen the sanctions on them, which have been crippling. Taking out Suleiman was a choice, Michelle, that President Bush rejected and that President Obama rejected. And it choice that President Trump made. Are we more or less secure as Americans uh, today with him dead, um, but the consequences of, of our having engaged for the first time in 40 years, 50, 70 years, in assassination of the senior official of another government? Would you say Americans are more or less secure today as a consequence of what's happened? Yeah. Look, he was a terrible man with the blood of hundreds, if not thousands, of Americans and, and many others on his hands. So in that sense, he was a legitimate target. But he, I think other presidents had the opportunity, decided not to take him out because of the second and third order strategic consequences of doing so. He was not only the head of a designated terrorist organization, he was also this, arguably the second most powerful Iranian government official. And so what this has done has basically now set the precedent uh, of assassinating a government official of a country with whom we are not formally at war. So what is to stop Iran from assassinating a four-star U.S. general or a National Security Council member when they next visit the region. It sets a terrible precedent. It opens a uh, Pandora's box on assassination. Furthermore, the way in which it was done on Iraqi soil without any coordination with the Iraqis has now set off a set of issues there where we may very well get pushed out of Iraq. Uh, and uh, at a time when we still 
have work to be done with our allies in terms of fighting ISIS and making sure that they do not regenerate and start attacking U.S. interests and, uh, and facilities around the region. So, Michelle, this is Roger again. Is, is there any path forward here? I mean, are, is this really two tarantulas in a jar fighting each other? Um, if you were in government again, you know, what, would you, what would your white paper be about where we go from this I, uh, highly unusual place? I, I think what we need to do is go back to first principles. What are our objectives? What is our strategy? You can't just use coercive measures, tactical coercive measures like sanctions and like military action without understanding what are they in service of? What is the strategy? I think we need to try to get a, a back to a negotiating table that includes not only Iran but a number of our regional partners um, to try to negotiate a deal that would constrain Iranian nefarious activity in the region and their nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. Um, that is the deal that has to be had. And I haven't seen any sign of that diplomatic initiative. I haven't seen any serious effort to con construct what that deal would look like. Um, we've seen an exhaustive, kind of very uh, ambitious list of objectives. Um, that Secretary Pompeo has put out there. Um, but it's everything, you know, that they could, we could possibly imagine. It's not a serious negotiating strategy. So I would like to see us get back to that. Frankly, right now, I don't think Iran's going to be very open to that, given what's just been happening. I think this latest cycle has set back the prospect for any serious negotiation in the short term. But I do hope we get there in the long term. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Our contributors thank will you. stay with us here. Coming up, we turn to the world of philanthropy for a fresh perspective on what 2020 holds in store. We're joined by the chief investment officer for Carnegie, Kim Liu. That's next. And next week, Afsane Beshlas and Sam Palmasano will join us around the table here. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Each week, we're going to welcome a guest with a somewhat different perspective on the big stories we're covering. This week, it's the perspective of one of the most prominent foundations in the country, the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Kim Liu is Carnegie's chief investment officer responsible for man investment management and oversight of some $3.5 billion in assets. Earlier in her career, Ms. Liu managed private equity for the Ford Foundation. An institutional investor named her CIO of the year last year. Congratulations, Kim, and welcome. Thank you. Good to have you. Mm -hmm. So you've been listening to what we've been talking about so far. What's happened in the last decade? What's going to happen in the next decade? From the point of view of a foundation, how is what you do different from what we're talking about? How is it the same? So one of the things that I heard that was particularly concerning, because I think it's true, is when Roger was talking about the fact that uh, expectations for returns over the coming 10 years is probably going to be significantly less. And Larry made the same point. And so there is consensus around the fact that because interest rates are so low, the expectation is that returns may be more modest. And for a foundation, that's death by a thousand cuts, because we are mandated to give away 5% a year. So unless we can feel pretty confident that we can re receive a 5 percent return, um, then that is a slowly declining of our portfolio. And really, it really puts our grantees at risk because we'd have less and less to provide for them over time. And so that is a much worse scenario, quite frankly, for us than if we had a big decline. Because if we had a big de decline, we reset our payout, and then we'd slowly see it rise back up again. But Right now, there's a general expectation that we're going to bleed assets slowly over time. And so, um, pretty concerning for the foundation community. So, Kim, what are your options? Do you take on more risk? Uh, do you change your liquidity or duration? I mean, what can you do to address that issue? So that goes back to some more stuff that you guys were talking about earlier, which speaks to the fact that we're looking for more active management. And we're looking for picking be it sectors or opportunities that we think offer us the opportunity to outperform. Traditionally, foundations and endowments have put a lot of their assets in alternatives. And that has been possible because we are long-term investors. And so we don't have to worry about the short-term nature of the market. We spend much less time thinking about what's going on in the stock market and in the bond market in any one time. And in fact, we can make investments in things that we think are underpriced 
and just hold them until they realize fill value without having to report on quarters and maybe not even annually sometimes. And so the, the, we mean, what we mean by the fact that we're long term is that we don't have to be worry about what happens in the short term. We can, we can invest in things that maybe don't actually produce substantial returns in the short term because we believe that they're going to produce returns in the long run. The problem, because we have a lot less degrees of freedom, because we so have so much wrapped up in alternatives, is that there is less um, ability to rebalance and to take advantage of mm -hmm. things that happen in the short run. We just sort of have to set a asset allocation and stick with it. Roger, how does that work for you? Because I think TIA is big in alternatives, aren't you? We're very big in alternatives. I think we're big in alternatives for maybe some of the reasons that Kim talked about which is we're thinking about payouts over the next 10, 20, 30 years because we're a retirement-oriented company. And so I think both of us share in common this notion that you want an investment that is going to, some of it short-term, but some of it's going to be long-term, which leads to a question. I think the, the thing we have in common is this notion of not needing immediate liquidity. And you should talk about maybe this, how do you think about liquidity, your liquidity needs, how you project that, and how you drive, how that drives your investment thesis and, and activities. So liquidity is in amazingly important for us because we have no inflows of capital. And mm -hmm. so because of that, we have to plan for it. Now, we are equity biased. Eighty-five percent of the portfolio is invested in some form of equities or equity-like securities with very little in fixed income securities. Um, the issue being that we we make sure that we have sufficient liquidity to pay our payout, 5 percent a year, plus the cost of running the office, plus the cost of rebalancing and meeting our other liabilities, which is a significant number of unfunded commitments as a result of having so much in alternatives. And what we think of that as ballast for the portfolio becomes an, under normal circumstances when the market doesn't behave particularly well and, then, and, some, and the Fed wants to stimulate, they lower interest rates makes people go out and spend more money and, and makes bond prices go up. We sell the bonds. We reinvest in equities. That's how we rebalance. There are, now we are concerned about the fact that people were not, will not actually go out and spend because they feel like they have to save more because interest rates are so low. And rates are so low that it will not have as big an impact. And so our fixed import portfolio doesn't have as much ballast as it used to have. And so that's a big concern. And there are a number of things like that which we have traditionally relied on in order for us to portfolio construct for the long term, which are not as dependable as they used to be. And so we're concerned about what that means and how we should think about things differently. I'd love to be wrong, but I think you guys are way optimistic for the next decade on alternatives. It used to be that there were only a limited number of alternatives trying to pick stocks, and there were all kinds of households making bad trades, and the alternative managers could make money, therefore. Now there's much less so-called noise trading and many, many more alternative managers, and they're still all charging high fees. Yeah. Used to be you could give up liquidity and make private equity investments and expect to get paid for the fact that you'd given up liquidity. Now there's trillions of dollars in private equity investments, and there aren't that many more deals, so they're being bid up in uh, price. Are you really confident that by turning to alternatives, you're going to generate substantial outperformance relative to stocks and bonds going forward in the way that's admittedly been true uh, in the past. I wonder if the game isn't losing some of its edge. I hope you're wrong, too. But I do agree <laughs> with you. I do think the game has changed. And I do think that what we've traditionally done is invest in alternatives because we believe that we can um, create value out of the noise. And you're absolutely right that there's far less inefficiency than it used to be. There's so much capital flowing into the market. There's so many different types of people sort of leveraging all the different opportunities we saw. One of the advantages that, that Carnegie has, which unfortunately Roger doesn't have, is the fact that we are small. We're only three and a half billion dollars. We can play in spaces that are niche spaces that capital can't flow in. It's not worth it for some um, of the larger managers to go into a market that only can support a $100 million fund or a $75 million fund. But we can play in that market. And so we, what we're doing is we're tending to go smaller. We're tending to go even more inefficient. It's a different risk profile. 
So we need to think about it differently. And we know that we are taking on more illiquidity risks because we're going into these markets which do not have the same level well, of we liquidity. Remember, we do have to remember here that when you go to alternatives, you're usually paying 1 percent, 2 percent in fees, and then you're paying I think that's going to have to change. 20 percent yeah. returns, yeah. and until you get those fees down, yeah. they've got to — they don't just have to outperform, they've got to outperform a lot yes. to outperform on an after-tax fee basis, because nowadays, as you know, you can get into index funds and pay zero, yeah. nothing no, at all. Absolutely. And so I'm just not sure that — that for the general investor, alternatives are going to be as good going forward as they have been in the past. If we're looking for markets where there may not be the efficiency that Larry just described, what about emerging markets? There are emerging markets where there isn't as much transparency, so there isn't as much efficiency. There's risk, but is that an opportunity? It is an opportunity, but it is a challenging markets to play in because what you need in those environments are good management teams. You need people who are good investors. You need aligned investments who who people who think in a similar way about the relationship between your, their, their investors and the markets and how they do things. And that's a hard thing to find. People have very different incentives. And quite honestly, when you're talking about emerging markets, at this point you're talking about China. China's 50 percent of the emerging markets benchmark. And that is one of the areas that we have to really start to think about how markets are changing, because we've relied on the fact that emerging markets could be differentiators. And we've just said that we're going to invest in emerging markets, and that's going to um, be a form of diversification, increasingly seeing that the world is not dividing evenly between developed markets and emerging markets. And there may be other ways we should look at it. And possibly, China is a form of diversification. There's very likely to be a decoupling between the United States and China, because they are going to make very different decisions about technology. And there are countries who are going to line up behind China, and then there are com companies and countries that are going to line up behind the United States. And I don't really know who the winner is going to be. And we're going to have to decide how we're going to participate in those markets and provide us with some opportunities. But there are clearly a lot of risks there, it's especially risks when, um, you know, we're concerned about what's going on there, and we're concerned about the laws and the regulations and how they'll change in response to things that we do here. And it is an inordinate amount of risk, but it is a big market. It's hard to ignore it. One of the things looking back in the last decade is the tide has risen pretty well with China. Looking forward to the next decade, how far is that tide going to keep going? Well, they are slowing. But even though they're still slowing, they're still growing a lot faster than we are. And if so if you're looking for growth, you need to go there. I also think that it's, it's not insignificant that it is a government that can control a lot of things, and it can turn on a dime in many respects. And so it can make adjustments in ways that are, that are arguably more challenging for us to make adjustments. Roger, how big an opportunity is China in the next decade? Uh, look, I think, broadly speaking, you're right. It is growing. It is still emerging. I think the challenges have to do with transparency, the ability to, you know, get your money out, depending on how you invest. Um, and your very good point around, you know, having teams who really understand what's going on. So I think it is absolutely still a class that one has to look at, but I'm a little more cautious, maybe, mm. you know, for those reasons. Yeah, no, and I, and, I, Chinese, and I agree with you. Chinese economy and the Chinese market are very different things. Yeah. A large part of the market cap of the Chinese market is state enterprises. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's where I'd want to be uh, yeah, betting with uh, my money. You got a lot of arbitrariness in the rules. I suspect you're going to have a bit of a general reluctance to see Americans and American institutions making large amounts yeah. of money and taking it out of uh, China. I'm not sure it's going to be so easy to find Chinese managers who could be completely trusted mm. by American sources of funds, given the political environment. Uh, in uh, China, you can't ignore you can't ignore it, but I think it's very be very easy uh, as hundreds of years of history of uh, optimistic Americans seeing China as a frontier and not having their hopes realized in terms of financial returns. I think Larry said it very very well. Um, could I ask a, a, a question, Kim? Yeah. So. 
What other big themes are you thinking about? I know there are a lot of investors who are thinking about uh, urbanization as a theme or the aging population as a theme, AI as a theme. Are there any themes that you think might be you know, a good place for you to play given that you've got to think about long-term investment returns? So we have actually, we um, as an institution study all of those things and we do research in all of them. So we've had presentations on the future of work and how that's going to change, what sort of skills will be needed. We, um, we bring in different peoples talking about demographics and how they are different in different environments. Um, we sp we've spent a lot of, in of time talking about how city structures are going to change and what sort of opportunities. It brings us back often to the, the limitations of that because there's a lot of natural resources that are needed to support some of these changes that are happening. These natural resources sit in geographies that maybe are not that easy for us to access, um, that may be challenging over time. And so that's sort of a break mm -hmm. on how fast this progress can happen. Um, and, you know, not to go back to China, but for, for sure, China recognizes that and, and are going out in search of control over a lot of those assets. And so it's a, it's a point of concern for us as we think about those opportunities. But yeah, we have to spend a lot of time on it. And demographics is for sure one of the biggest things we talk about. And it really influences how we think about agriculture and food, how we mm -hmm. think about retirement. Hugely concerned about retirement savings and what that means. Mm -hmm. The pressure that puts on interest rates, quite frankly. Um, and how much, you know, more challenging my job is yeah. and our jobs a are. A lot to look forward to in the next decade. Okay, many thanks now to Kim Liu of the Carnegie Corporation. We're going to get some final thoughts from our contributors. That's next. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We had a lot on corporate governance throughout 2019, but not nearly as much as we got from Carlos Ghosn just this week when he had a two and a half hour, count him, two and a half hour news conference over Lebanon to explain why he had fled Japan. So my question for you, Roger, really is about corporate governance. Is this a one off? Is this an unusual situation? Or do we have an imperial CEO phenomenon going on here? Look, I think the reality is this is highly unusual, right? You won't find many CEOs doing the two hour press conference. Having said that, I think the issues around corporate governance, understanding what CEOs do, and importantly, what's the role of the board, that is going to be a major theme as we keep going forward. It's just getting started. It was pretty extraordinary. Carlos Ghosn went through details about who signed off on his T&E, essentially, <laughs> and he said there were all these controllers signing off on it. He was the CEO. This is a guy who broke bail. This is the Trumpification of the CEO. Egomania, disregard uh, for uh, law, total uh, self-involvement. This is extraordinary, but like many extraordinary things, like Donald Trump uh, himself, it stands for some much broader trends that are matters of grave concern. At the same time, Roger, you'd be reluctant to be a CEO in Japan right now because their laws seem to be a little different than ours. Oh, absolutely. Look, uh, one of the things that has emerged here for many people is an understanding of what the uh, criminal justice system is like in Japan. Uh, unusual place where you have 99% guilty. Yeah, 99% guilty. How about that? Okay. Many thanks to our contributors, Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. That's it for Bloomberg Wall Street Week. See you next week.